$20 and $30 pitcher values that everyone's going to have when you're only starting with 20 and under dollar pitchers in the auction equivalent. So for that reason, I think it's important to take uh, at least a pitcher. And as my research has shown, the top eight pitchers on average uh, tend to earn a better return on investment than a lot of the middle rounds. So for that reason, you should take one. I do not think that you need to, you need to take two pitchers. I think that you can work the pocket ace strategy, but I don't think you need to. I think that uh, you're okay with taking a pitcher in the second round or in the fourth round or in the third round. Uh, you know, of value. I think you can work with it. You just have to be cognizant not to go so far below the hitter pitcher split. And I think you can make it up with one. Uh, you don't have to pick the two. Uh, I I think it's a mistake. I think there's a lot of great hitters that are really first round values that are dipping to the middle of second round value because pitching is being pushed up so much. Um, I'm okay with passing on on those pitchers who are more riskier in my mind, and I'll go with the solid value of a hitter in the second round, and I'll pick my pitcher in the third round. I have no problem with doing that. It's whatever it's whatever comes to you, really, in the draft, but I don't have to force it, is my point here. Can, can I ask a question uh, real quick? Uh, no, no, say if you're starting, say, top, you know, four pick or something like that, and you want to go with the hitter, which I'm totally fine with. And these are, you know, elite stats you're getting. You have to, be- before walking into that draft room, have your at least first few rounds mapped out and where you're getting your pitcher. After say, if Fernando Tatis is your guy or Juan Soto, whoever, and with the first pick, you're going there. What are you doing two, three, and on, on that four, five? How, how are you walking away with pitching? Because uh, you're going to get speed from one of those guys, so you'll be in a good spot there. But if you don't have your pitching planned out, you're going to get run over. And, you know, maybe you could say, I, I'm going to zig and zag. I, I, I'm fine if you have a plan. And sometimes it does work when you fade the market, but you better, you've got to be right. You can't be wrong. I don't, I don't think you have to have two pitchers in the first two rounds, uh, but... I I would very much, like you say, with the splits, and I'd very much want to get one of that first two because even on the other side, if you're picking at the turn and say you went Yellick and Bellinger, just two names, at 3-4, you better be committed that there's two guys that you like and that they're going to be there. So it, it just that's the approach. Like having that game plan set up in your mind or that roadmap already planned out before you get in there based on what players possibly are available for there and how you're going to audible if you have to. And and that's, that's a good point. So the bit, the overall point that, that you're making loud and clear is that, um, you know, we've decided here that you need to pick up some pitcher in the first four rounds. And if you don't pick a pitcher in the first one or two, you you need to have that plan. You're not you can't win this thing by walking out of the first four rounds without a pitcher, right? It, you just can't. So you need to plan it. And of course that of course self reinforces. And why are NFBC players pushing it even more? Because they're saying the same thing that you just said, Matt. Well, if I don't pick a pitcher now, even if he's probably not value wise there, where am I getting my pitching? And so that self enforces and pushes a pitcher pitching even more. Uh, I I think you have a little bit of that going on, don't you think? Yeah, sure. Look, I I think there's people that, just in general, others are going to copy other uh, successful strategies, stuff like that as well. But I think it's the basic supply and demand. First off, I don't think there's many aces. I think there's maybe like three pitchers in baseball that are really current aces right now. Uh, There's a lot of SP1s or, you know, like stud guys that are really good, guys I, I would, you know, want to have uh, as my foundation, but I think we throw around the term ace like it's everybody's an ace just because you're an SB1. I mean, for me, say I had a, say my cutoff is uh, Woodruff or Castillo, and if I know their ADP is, say, 25, if I'm picking at two and I take Tatis, and I know after 25, all the guys I like are gone, I either got to decide I'm going to load up on hitting or who am I pulling up? What pitcher am I pulling up? Is it Zach Gallen, for instance? Uh, you know, is it, you know, I don't know. I'm just trying to say. I'm just trying to give some names. Yeah, you're yeah. Gonna, if, you don't, if you're not asking those questions before entering it, and that's right. why. When you have 
before the thirtieth pick, if if thirteen pitchers are going to be off the board, who's your number fourteen? You feel comfortable with? Right, right. And you're making the case, of course, to say that Degrom, uh, you might want to pick him number two overall because that solves that problem right away. You get Degrom, and then you'll have a better mix of hitters available at at the two three turn at the two three turn. Uh, if you pick Degrom, right? It's it's about opportunity cost in the first round or so. If I don't pick this person, who am I going to get after? And because of the fact that Degrom is so much better than Zach Gallen that you'd have to push up all the way to the top of the third round. That's such a big difference in value. Uh, I think the difference between Degrom and him is much, much, much lower, uh, is much greater than the difference between Tatis and let's say a Kyle Tucker. Uh, right in terms of expected production, you can get a lot of what Tatis is giving in Tucker. Obviously, not as good, but the difference between Degrom and the reliability in Gallon is so great that you might consider, from a game theory standpoint, go with Degrom as your as one of the top one, two, three picks, even right. Yeah, but just to like say you thought Degrom was too risky. Like some people think he's going to be thirty three. You know, they'd rather be a year too early. Then you know you could set your KDS where say if you know Bieber's going ninth for the most part, or you 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 set the first pick you want is five. You want it to be Bieber, or if Cole's your guy, if Cole's your guy, it's pretty much with the Grom. You 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 want to be one of the top picks, one or two, because those guys I think come March. I've seen it happen in, as the entry fees have gone up in, in the ones I've played in. They go one two. So, but now with the Bieber. If you really believe he's arrived and he's an ace, then set your KDS at five. So now you get a Shane Bieber who you think is an ace, and then you get the you pick five spots earlier in the second round as opposed to waiting to the thirtieth pick. You're picking twenty sixth. So that's the I'm just trying to put out there how you should be looking at it, or if you're comfortable now with ba- uh, Trevor Bauer with the Dodgers. Whatever it is, look at that and then build it from there. That's, that's I think, a winning strategy. But it doesn't have to be a, a pitcher. KDS, just for the audience, is Kentucky Derby style, where, uh, you know, in, in selecting, uh, you get the choice of where you are going to draft from, what slot, 1 through 15. Uh, what's, it's not randomized where you're going to pick from. It's randomized who gets the choice to pick first. If you're the first person randomly selected to choose, you can choose your draft spot. Uh, and what happens is everybody puts in a preference of 15 spots in order, and the first person who picks, they get their first choice. The next person, they get their top choice that's not selected, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's go to Ruvain on, on this first, since we're talking about it. Um, wh- what would be your preference as, as to how to pick KDS uh, very roughly in uh, upcoming 2021 drafts in the NFBC? Well, I think Matt nailed it. I, I happen to like uh, picks and KDFs like between four and eight. I think that's where the sweet spot is. I think that's where one of those top pitchers will fall to you. I like taking pitching in the first round. Uh, if one of those pitchers fall to me, then I, I'll take one of those pitchers. And if one of those pitchers don't fall to me in the fourth, four to eight, I'll still get one of the top three or four hitters. So I'd like that also. Um, I try to stay away from the wheel, either either wheel, more so the 14-15. I, I, I don't like that spot at all. Um, it's very, very hard to win there just because you have to plan so far ahead and you have to reach so many times when you're on that side of the wheel. When you're on the other side, one and two, that's great. You'll get great value in your one and two, but then you have to wait for everyone to come back and your whole strategy can sometimes go out the window because you don't know what's going to happen over the next 30 picks. Yeah, I, I like uh, the middle. Um, I think there's an advantage, not just for the first round, I think more towards the, the entire draft. Because uh, to me, I like to win the draft by extracting value. And if you're picking at the wheel, you're going to have to guess at who's going to be there 30 picks later. And you might have to reach for somebody a little bit earlier if you really want them and your values say so. If you were picking in the middle, then you have to reach a little bit less, right? You have to reach a half a round less. And you get more information if you're in the middle. If you're at the end points, you get one-time information, and you have to make two decisions off of the one information. Here you get two decisions off of two informations. I think it's easier to balance categories possibly at at the endpoints, but in terms of extracting value, I like the middle. Uh, And especially this year, if I think that some of the pitching is going to fall to the middle, uh, I think it's a great place to be. Uh, What what are your preferences for this year, Matt? Well, if I'm going to go with, uh, say, a Cole or DeGrom, 
then I want one or two. Or if, if I think they're both equal, then I would put two as my uh, as my KDS because then I, I I have that foundation guy there, and then I can decide if another pitcher fell that I didn't think was going to fall at that two three turn. I'm like, you know what? This is a, this is a great start, and and I get my top hitter. Or I can say I got the Cole Degrom. Let me get two hit uh, two really good hitters here. And then four or five, I'll fill in another pitcher and another, you know, try and add some speed, whatever it may be. Uh, so I do think if you're going to start hitter, the way it's been recently, now this might change over the next month, but if you're going to start hitter, that six to eight range has become a sweet spot because you're guaranteed, like Mookie Betts has fallen to eight. I've seen yeah, it like eight crazy, right? on, on multiple occasions. And that's like the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, Mookie Betts, if he, he, I mean, he could be the the one one guy this year. I wouldn't be shocked. So, and he, he early on he was going like second overall. I think when we first started with this, or he was third at, at, at the worst. So he's going at eighth. But now you say you start with a Trey Turner. Uh, if he gets you, if you know you're banking, writing in say thirty seven stolen bases for Trey Turner. And you got the seventh pick. Let's just make it easy. Right there, you know you got a good lead in speed. He's going to provide average, some pop. So now you get to play. Uh, you get to play it a little differently. You grab, say, that pitcher, and now you don't have to be so focused on just pounding on. You still want to get some speed and keep adding and adding on to that. But you're not like starting out with eight stolen bases in the first round. You got thirty-eight. You know. The, that sets it up maybe a lot easier, but again, you know, you probably want to nail that pitcher in the second round there, unless you think those those values that you have aren't correct, and it's better to wait in the third. But it, it, there's a difference of caliber between the second and the third round, and I I, I think that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is great strategy uh, for, for everyone to hear. Uh, and this is exactly what you need to think about and consider when you pick your spot and when you make decisions as to your plan. Always have a plan. Uh, the, the worst thing you can do is, is to have no plan. I'll see what they get me. No, uh, have a plan. Think about what's going to happen and know what your options are ahead of time. Um all right, we're going to switch gears and do a little bit of ATC player discussion. Today we're going to talk about outfielders. Uh, Matt, what we do here is we take the ATC projections and pit them against some of the NFBC values and see who rises a little bit to the top, who seems as perceived bargains. And then we don't just say, just take them because the ATC projections say so. We then discuss them and see if we agree with that. Uh, first guy up here, Anthony Santander. Uh, he's a guy that looks pretty solid going in the 11th round. Uh, good barrel rate, decent strikeout rate, great bat of ball tendencies, should bat in the heart of lineup in a great ballpark. He's got a nice nice little track record the last two years in a row. Uh, according to the ATC volatility metrics, this is a low volatile guy. The interprojectional skew is nicely negative, so there's even upside to him. Other than stolen bases, I think he's a little bit of a cut above everybody else who's going at that time. He does have a similar profile to a lot of people uh, that are that are going around, but um, it seems like a low volatility play. Any interest in Anthony Santander for you this year, Matt? Uh, he's a guy I don't have, believe it or not. I do like him though. I, I do like the uh, the profile, the the plate skills. He hits the ball in the air. It's, he, you know, his max EV was was pretty nice last year as well. His batting average should be above uh, league average, which is always good. It's not like a guy that has power and is going to hurt you. So that's uh, that's something you need to consider. It's for me, for the most part, again, it's not all the time. I do volume. I don't play in one or two drafts for the year. Uh, one of the things I do like, I joke around, I call it my Sicilian strategy from like the Queen's Gambit is I like to go outfield heavy. I'm a person that has no problem loading up an outfield early. I know some people swear they have to fill out their uh, they have to fill out their infield first and all that. To me, uh, I'm fine. I'll, I'll figure it out. I have players 
that I want. I've, I've done enough of these. I kind of know where the board's going to be. So, But I think Santander is 